Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining today's Chief FOIA Officers Council meeting. Before we begin, please ensure that you have opened the WebEx participant and chat panels by using the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. <clears throat> Please note, all audio connections are currently muted and this conference is being recorded. You are welcome to submit written questions throughout the meeting, which will be addressed at the Q&A session of the meeting. To submit a written question, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, then enter your question in the message box provided and send. To ask a question via WebEx audio, please click the raise hand icon on your WebEx screen, which is located above the chat panel to the right, to place yourself in the question queue. If you are connected to today's meeting via phone audio, please dial pound 2 on your telephone keypad to enter the question queue. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. With that, I will turn the meeting over to Alina Simo, Director, Office of Government Information Services. Alina, please go ahead. Thanks, Michelle. Good morning, everyone. Uh, apologies for the slight delay and us getting started, but we assure you that we still have a great program up ahead. Uh, thank you again for joining us today for our second Virtual Chief Boy Officers Council meeting, uh, probably not our last. Um, I hope everyone has been staying healthy, safe, and well. I am Alina Simo, Director of the Office of Government Information Services here at the National Archives and co-chair of this council. Let me introduce my co-chair, Bobby Talibian, Director of the Office of Information Policy. Bobby? Bobby, please unmute your line. We're unable to hear you. I will do that for you right now. Well, thank you. Thank Bobby, you. Go ahead. Hi. Thank you. Can you hear me? Thank you, Alina, and thank you all for joining us um, for uh, a, a great meeting today. We have a really great agenda uh, and look forward to getting into it. Um, in a minute, you're, uh, you're going to hear welcoming remarks from Archivist of the United States, David Ferriero. And then Bobby will introduce the Associate Attorney General, Anita Gupta, who will provide opening remarks as well. Alina and I will then each provide an overview of uh, OIP Notices' work since our last meeting. We have some exciting updates to share. Uh, and then you will next hear from the Council's two committees, the Committee for Cross-Agency Collaboration and Innovation and the Technology Committee. Uh, excited to have the two co-chairs of the committees join us later this morning, along with a few members of the committee. Um, and we're uh, going to plug in the, now and throughout. Uh, we hope that the work that they're doing, um, which uh, we truly, really appreciate, uh, inspires other agencies um, to both take advantage of those resources, um, but also to join our efforts and join the committee. So we're always taking uh, volunteers. And if you're interested in volunteering, please do reach out to either Alina or myself or uh, directly to one of the co-chairs of the, the, the committees. Uh, great. Thanks uh, very much, Bobby. Uh, I want to uh, just second that plug. We definitely need more volunteers. During the course of our meeting today, we will pause and check in to see if there are any questions from our agency FOIA colleagues that come in via chat. We are simultaneously live streaming today's meeting on the NARA YouTube channel, and we will be monitoring the chat functions both on WebEx and YouTube. So please chat any questions you may have. Uh, you'll see the slide that we have up that says chat to all panelists to ensure that comments are seen by our moderators. That's very important. Bobby, over to you. Thank you, Alina. Uh, as we have in the past, we will uh, reserve time at the end of today's uh, session for public comments. Uh, we'll be opening the telephone lines at the end of our meeting for the last 15 minutes uh, for any oral questions or comments from the public. Uh, we ask out of uh, consideration to others and uh, the time that you please limit your comments to three three minutes. Uh, and once your three minutes has uh, expired, um, we will let you know so that we can move on to the next commentator. Uh, we are monitoring the chat on WebEx and on the NARA YouTube channel, and we'll read out any appropriate questions or comments we receive from the public. Alina? 
Thanks. We have received several written comments um, and submissions in advance of today's meeting. We have reviewed all of them carefully and evaluated them prior to posting uh, nine of them to ensure they satisfy our posting policy on public comments. So I want to invite everyone to look at our website, archives.gov forward slash OGIS, and uh, go to the Chief Boy Officers Council link on the left hand side. And there you can see the, uh, the comments that have been posted. We posted these public comments after remediating them to ensure that they are compliant with Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act. I also want to note that the chat function in WebEx um, or the NARA YouTube channel is not the proper forum to submit extensive public comments. You may submit public comments at any time by emailing us at ogisopenmeeting, all one word, at nara.gov, and we will consider posting them to the OGIS website. The chat function on both platforms should be used to ask clarifying questions or provide brief comments or questions that we will consider reading out loud at the end of today's meeting. Finally, a reminder that the council meeting is not the appropriate venue for concerns about individual FOIA requests or issues. If you need OGIS assistance, you may request it by emailing us at OGIS at NARA.gov. At this time, I would like to introduce Archivist of the United States, David Ferriero. David, over to you. Mr. Ferriero, you may, go, you may proceed. You are unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yes, so we can hear you. Please Thank go ahead. Thank you very much. Greetings from the National Archives flagship building in Washington, D.C., which sits on the ancestral lands of the Koch Tanks people. Now that we're the speaker, you can kind of hear it from my position. Are you hearing an echo? No, so you may proceed. We can hear you. Okay. It's hard to believe that we're 20 months into the COVID-19 pandemic, which has challenged us all in ways which were hardly imaginable when the Chief FOIA Officers Council was established by the FOIA Improvement Act of 2016. While the council was created five years ago, it was the Open Government Act of 2007 that established the role of Chief FOIA Officer, mandating that each agency designate a senior official to oversee and ensure FOIA compliance and efficiency. Here at the National Archives, that person is our general counsel, Gary M. Stern. Like many chief FOIA officers across the government, Gary has faced enormous and unique challenges since the pandemic began in March 2020. Here at the National Archives and Records Administration, a large percentage of FOIA requests we receive seek access to records that exist in paper. The vast majority of them are archival records created by executive branch agencies and the White House deemed permanent and transferred to the legal custody of the National Archives. The pandemic forced full or, or, or partial closure of all the NARA offices that process FOIA requests. At our National Personnel Records Center, although we had to reduce our onsite capacity, we never fully closed, continuing to process emergency requests from veterans. NPRC is starting to ramp up its staffing again to address the backlog of FOIA requests and recently began operating around the clock to ensure veterans and their families get records they need for medical treatment, burials, and other services. Despite those unprecedented challenges, I'm proud of the FOIA work accomplished during the pandemic under Gary's leadership as a chief FOIA officer. The National Archives suggested staff work priorities to best position these offices to continue to facilitate access to NARA's records. And to that end, some of the staff in these offices were issued laptops and given access to additional software to allow them to conduct searches and complete redactions where possible. The archival FOIA processing offices focused on identifying records, preparing files, and creating descriptions for records of great public interest that had previously been available only in paper format for access through the National Archives catalog. Staff in these offices also spent time updating or creating processing guidance we at the National Archives acknowledge that closure of federal record centers due to circumstances 
well beyond our control has affected FOIA programs throughout the government, even as FRC staff have responded to emergency requests for records throughout the pandemic. I appreciate your patience during these unprecedented times, and I'm pleased to report that our centers are gradually resuming operations based on local public health conditions and specific safety criteria. With that, I wish to the Chief FOIA Officers Council a happy fifth anniversary. I look forward to hearing reports today from the Technology Committee and the Committee on Cross-Agency Collaboration and Innovation. The important work of both committees ties directly to the statutory mandate that the Chief FOIA Officer of each agency monitor quarter implementation and ensure efficient compliance. Before I turn the meeting back over to Bobby, I invite you to join me tomorrow afternoon, Thursday, November 18th at 5 p.m. Eastern Time for a conversation between Law Professor Margaret Foka, former committee member, FOIA Advisory Committee member, and current FOIA Advisory Committee member Tom Sussman about Professor Foka's new book, Saving the Freedom of Information Act. I look forward to an interesting and rich discussion and hope you will join us. Details are available on the events calendar at archives.gov. Thank you, and back to you, Bob. Thank you so much, David. Very much appreciate all your support for the council. Um, at this time, I'd like to welcome, um, we had some technical difficulties, so hopefully um, this works, but we'd like to welcome the Associate Attorney General of the United States, uh, Vida Gupta. I'm very excited to have her provide us welcoming remarks. Thank you, Bobby. Good morning, and thank you for joining us for today's Chief FOIA Officers Council meeting. On behalf of the Department of Justice, I'd like to welcome all of the Chief FOIA Officers and Agency FOIA officials to our Fall FOIA Officer Council meeting. I also want to welcome the members of the public that are joining us today. At the Department of Justice, we take very seriously our responsibility of transparency and accountability through faithful compliance with the Freedom of Information Act. In his first week in office, Attorney General Garland recognized the importance of the mission of FOIA at the Department of Justice's annual Sunshine Week event. The Attorney General noted that without accountability, democracy is impossible. And democratic accountability requires the kind of transparency that FOIA makes possible. Meant more than 55 years ago, the Freedom of Information Act has been an important tool for keeping the federal government open and accountable. The Supreme Court explains that the basic purpose of FOIA is to ensure an informed citizenry vital to the functioning of a democratic society needed to check against corruption and to hold the governed accountable to the governed. As someone who has utilized FOIA in my own prior roles outside of government, I know how important the act is for government accountability. At its core, FOIA is about public trust trust that those who are charged with faithfully executing the laws are in fact doing so with integrity and in the public's interest. Fulfilling the goals of the FOIA is not an easy task, as many of you know best, and COVID only made that uh, even harder. The U.S. government receives and processes over 700,000 FOIA requests every year, many involving multifaceted searches, consultations, and complex line-by-line -line reviews of large number of documents. FOIA work is often very difficult and time intensive. And finding the balance between FOIA's presumption of disclosure, while also upholding legal, legal guardrails for the protection of sensitive interests such as our national security, individual pr personal privacy, and law enforcement is also very challenging. And that's what the law requires, for us to lift up and protect a person's ability to seek information from the U.S. government while also ensuring that guardrails to protect the public interest are maintained. As many of you who have worked in FOIA over the years know, the department has long held that FOIA is everyone's responsibility. And I wanna thank all of the FOIA professionals who work tirelessly day in and day out to meet their agency's disclosure obligations. The key to the success of any agency FOIA program is the leadership you provide. The law itself recognizes the importance of leadership support by designating a chief FOIA officer at each agency that is at the assistant secretary or equivalent level. And I take great pride in serving as the Department of Justice's chief FOIA officer. 
As chief FOIA officers, we must all continually review all aspects of our respective agency's FOIA administration to ensure that records are released lawfully and efficiently. As I mentioned, the day-to-day -day work in administering the FOIA is often not easy, and agency FOIA professionals deserve our support to meet these challenges. It's also important that we continue to remind agency program personnel outside the FOIA office of their critical role in making sure the agency's FOIA obligations are fully and timely met. The Department of Justice is committed to serving as a resource and providing counsel to your agency in the advancement of FOIA administration. In just a few minutes, Bobby will be providing updates on several important initiatives that, the, that OIP has been working on that will benefit your agency's FOIA administration. He'll be discussing new reporting requirements and tools, guidance that encourages agencies to offer additional substantive FOIA training and establish standard operating procedures, and the application of the deliberative process exemption. We're also looking forward to releasing new standardized e-learning training this year. Finally, as you know, we are continuing to build on the functionality of FOIA.gov. The development of centralized search capability across agencies is going to greatly enhance the public's ability to find the information that they're seeking. You'll also hear about the work of two committees established by the Council to address technology, resources, administering the FOIA virtually, and professional development. I want to especially thank the committee members for their dedication to FOIA and their hard work on these issues. Thank you again for all you do as Chief FOIA officers to ensure that we have an accountable democracy and transparent government that works for the public interest. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lita, for the kind words and, and, uh, and, and continuous support for the departments and agencies FOIA administration. All right, I think next we'll move on to, uh, we have some updates. I have some updates from OIP, uh, so we'll go to the next slide. And we can skip this slide and go to the next one. Thank you. Uh, so a number, a few updates I wanted to provide and some initiatives that we're excited about. Uh, we'll discuss uh, new reporting requirements and tools. Uh, it recently issued guidance since our last Chief Warrior Officer Council meeting and some updates on new resources and updates uh, to, to FOIA.gov. Next slide. First, as you all know, agency annual FOIA reports, it's, it's that time of year again, uh, and agencies have been working, and you've been working on your annual FOIA reports. Uh, those were due to OIP by November 15th, just a couple days ago. Uh, we appreciate all the effort that it, you're putting into compiling this data, which is really important, uh, and shedding transparency on the FOIA itself, the administration of the FOIA itself. Um, if your agency has not submitted your data, please do so as soon as you can. And if you're having trouble, please do reach out to OIP's compliance team. Uh, all agency annual FOIA reports are required to be posted by March 1 of this year. Um, so we wanna make sure that you are on track and your data is appropriately validated um, to meet that deadline. We did, uh, and as you know, a significant resource in compiling and uh, producing your annual FOIA report is the Department of Justice Annual FOIA Report Handbook available on the department's website. Um, we did update uh, the handbook uh, due to um, enhancements to the annual FOIA report tool, which hopefully um, you will find helpful in submitting your report, um, but also in some of the substantive areas. One substantive area specific, uh, on Pages 60 to 62, we updated the guidance on how agencies should report uh, their subsection A2 proactive disclosures. Uh, we did this after uh, engagement with GAO. Um, and uh, specifically, we, we wanted to emphasize that the, the, the way that they, the, these should be reported are by the number of records that are posted that are subject to A2 online, as opposed to um, pages. This is specifically drawn from the statutes statutes language. Uh, we can recognize that that, that, that is difficult um, because records are posted in a variety of different ways. And so um, how you can account for a record for the purposes of reporting this uh, might be challenging depending on how it's posted, whether it's a PDF or it's laid on the website on HTML, it's a video, it's a spreadsheet, it's a, um, a, a, a response, it's a frequently requested record, which maybe in itself has multiple records, but it's one posting. Uh, and so what we've done is we've laid out a number of these examples and how agencies should report uh, them, uh, count them 
in, in terms of each of those examples. So hopefully that will make it easier for agencies to account for this reporting requirement, um, but also um, will help, help us have more consistency across agencies on how this data is reported. Next slide. Of course, uh, the uh, one of the other three reports that agencies are obligated to um, complete during the year is the 20 is the chief FOIA officer report. And uh, we issued the 22 chief FOIA officer report uh, guidelines. Deadlines for those uh, for agencies that receive more than 50 requests the prior fiscal year um, there. We asked that they provide their draft report to OIP by January 10. Uh, agencies that receive 50 requests or less are not required to report, um, but are encouraged to report if there's additional information that would provide context to uh, what's being reported in their annual FOIA report. And we ask that those draft reports be provided to OIP by February 11th. Uh, this all leading to all, all agencies required to, leading for all agencies to be required to post their final uh, Chief FOIA Officer reports on March 14th, 2022. Next slide. Uh, the 2022 Chief Fire Officer Report Guidelines continue to focus on the five key areas of FOIA administration we focused on in the past, applying a presumption of openness in administering the FOIA, ensuring that there are effective systems in place for responding to requests, uh, the use of proactive disclosures, increasing the use of technology, and of course, improving timeliness and reducing backlogs. Next slide. As we've done in the past, every year, uh, based off of um, feedback from the public and, and from agencies and um, new initiatives in, in our engagement, we've modified or added new questions to the Chief Foreign Officer Report. Uh, just to highlight some of the new questions for this year, recognizing the importance of records management, we've added a question regarding records management training for FOIA professionals, emphasized uh, requester outreach by modifying that question, um, and also recognizing, as the associate mentioned, that FOIA is everyone's responsibility, uh, that non-FOIA professionals are receiving briefings and trainings, and in particular, senior leaders are aware of their FOIA obligations. Um, standardized operating procedures, we're asking um, more specific questions about that. Continuing to survey agencies on first party requests and alternative access to technology, and really focus this year uh, on the core uh, responsibilities in the chat statute for chief FOIA officers for reviewing their programs to ensure that they have adequate technology and resources uh, to meet the needs of their FOIA administration. We focused uh, more on, uh, we modified questions to focus on A2 proactive disclosures. And also we're continuing to monitor how agencies have been impacted um, by COVID-19 on uh, reducing their backlogs and effectively administering their FOIA administration. Finally, uh, we always had a question at the, in the final part of the Chief FOIA Officer Report for reducing backlog and backlog reduction plans. This year, we're asking for a little bit more than we have in the past uh, for agencies to detail about what their backlog reduction plans are, and in particular, how they develop them. Next slide. Finally, the quarterly FOIA report. Uh, as you know, agencies have um, for a long time now, in addition to the annual FOIA report and the Chief FOIA Report, provided four, uh, a few key, a number of key FOIA statistics on a quarterly basis. The number of requests received, processed, at, in the process at the agency, uh, the number of requests in the backlog, and the agency's um, the agency's uh, uh, status of their ten oldest requests. Well, we issued new guidance recently, and we're excited uh, to, to have launched this um, that allows. Uh, you to use a new tool directly on FOIA.gov and providing this data to uh, to us and on the website much more efficiently uh, and effectively. Um, so as in the past where you may have had to involve your CIO team, now as a, the, the, um, the agency FOIA.gov manager at your office um, can directly put this data in um, FOIA.gov through their account and it'll appear um, on FOIA.gov in, in that way. So we're excited to uh, have that out there to lessen the burden, uh, this reporting burden on agencies. Next slide. But also uh, the new tool has allowed us to streamline the public uh, and improve the public facing um, side of this data. Now uh, requesters, agencies and the public uh, can view this quarterly data, just like they can view the annual report. Uh, and 
And significantly moving forward now, um, we're able to retain this data, not just for the current fiscal year, um, but historically. So over time, um, agencies, the public requesters can look to see historically how agencies have done in a certain quarter, um, not in just that fiscal year, but compared to other fiscal years. Next slide. So since our last meeting, we've had a couple of uh, gui formal guidance articles that have been issued by OIP, and I just want to touch on those and bring everyone's attention to, to them. Um, as we've done in prior years, after reviewing your chief FOIA officer reports, um, we conduct an assessment. Uh, and last year, in issued guidance to, for further improvement based off of the chief FOIA officer reports in our assessments. This guidance um, highlights the importance of substantive FOIA training. Um, but as the associate mentioned, we recognize that FOIA is everyone's responsibilities. Also, training and briefing all agency program personnel, uh, including senior leadership, uh, on FOIA and FOIA's the obligations of FOIA to your agency. One thing we've note we've now from the past couple of years now, you know, um, in looking backwards, have, have seen is the uh, the impact of COVID nineteen, of course was significant for a lot of agencies at the beginning, um, but it also has pushed a lot of us to improve processes uh, and we've mitigated some of those challenges with improved processes, workflows and technology. Um, so taking those lessons learned, we want to encourage agencies to plan ahead um, and build on those as we work towards uh, reducing backlogs and processing times. Also uh, emphasizing the importance of standard operating procedures. This was a question that we had in the Chief FOIA Officer report. Uh, and a lot of agencies have and are um, uh, various types of standard operating procedures, which is really important for ensuring um, not just consistency uh, in the quality of FOIA review and, and production, um, but also retaining institutional knowledge, particularly for those agencies that have smaller FOIA offices uh, where turnover could be significant. Um, so we want to continue to encourage standard operating procedures, um, both the uh, having them and updating them regularly. And we're, we're, we're asking about that in the Chief FOIA Officer report again. Um, and if any agency would like uh, to discuss um, their standard operating procedures or how, how the best is um, put together one and update it, we're ha happy to, to, to work with agencies on this as well. And of course, uh, agencies were encouraged to review their FOIA regulations and ensure that they are, are up to date as well. Next, next slide. And as you know, last March, the Supreme Court issued a, uh, an opinion in U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services versus Sierra Club, which examined Exemption 5 of the FOIA um, and the deliberate process privilege. I've spoken about the, the case um, in prior meetings, so I won't get into the details of the case, but uh, I just wanted to emphasize the, the guidance, um, which emphasizes two key takeaways from the decision. Um, the court did not modify the signature of Exemption 5, um, but it did, uh, it did, as I said, mention, um, highlight two key elements of consideration when determining whether something, a record is pre-decisional. Um, first, uh, the court recognized that um, a record is not final simply because it's the last version of something and nothing else follows it. The key, consider, the key consideration in determining whether a record is, is final is whether it is final, it is the final decision that the agency has settled on. And second, when determining uh, whether a position is the final decision that a agency has settled on, we look to the, the legal consequences of that record and not any practical impact or effect it had on the agency's decision making. So key to that is that the agency itself treated that record as a final decision with legal effect. So those are the two um, key considerations of whether a record's pre-decisional that the Supreme Court emphasized um, in the Sierra Club case, um, and two key takeaways from our guidance, which is available on OIP's website. Next slide. We're also, ex I'm excited to uh, talk about FOIA.gov. We have a lot of exciting initiatives uh, around FOIA.gov, improving the functionality um, of the, the site. One of the um, projects that we've been working on with GSS 10X team, uh, which we completed the first two phases, uh, was a proposal to investigate a centralized search capability um, where requesters can search for records 
um, in any uh, on agency website and FOIA libraries from a central place without having to go to individual websites and FOIA libraries. Um, we hope that this is going to uh, assist requesters in getting information that is already available um, more easily without having to make a request or, or assist in making more targeted requests that are easier to um, process. We have uh, been approved, and so we're excited uh, here at OIP and for uh, for the government uh, for phase three, uh, where we're going to now work with GSA on uh, the idea that we have and how we can accomplish this and prototype it, um, probably with a small group of agencies. So we'll be looking for some volunteers um, to for the prototype as we build towards the final product, which will be the government-wide FOIA, FOIA library on FOIA.gov. Next slide. Of course, key to uh, all of this has been um, the interoperability between agencies, FOIA program systems, and FOIA.gov. Um, as you know, uh, DOJ and OMB issued guidance on achieving interoperability in FOIA.gov when the National FOIA was, portal was um, established and, and launched in February 2019. Uh, and essentially, there's two ways of interoperability. Agencies uh, with automated systems were required to become interoperable by the end of fiscal year 21, which was just the past October, uh, and agencies with non, using an API, and agencies with non-automated solutions uh, were required to become interoperable through their agency account by receiving structured emails from FOIA.gov uh, of requests submitted by requesters. Uh, we're really excited that the vast majority of agencies have achieved interoperability and met the 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 guidance that we issued, and there, you know, had just uh, some small group of agencies that we're still working with um, that we needed a little bit more time with. And so we appreciate agencies' work on this and your patience as we work with you to make sure you're you're linked up to FOIA.gov. And so we'll continue to work to make sure um, agencies are interoperable, fully interoperable, and look forward to building on this interoperability um, in the future. Which I think brings me to my next slide. Next slide. So one of the other things that we've done uh, is, and, and talking about building on the interoperability that now we have, is engaged 18F, and we've been working with 18F over the past three months, OIP, on discovery and a path analysis for the additional functionality that should be developed or pursued next. Uh, and we did extensive interviews with agencies and the public. If you are one of the agencies or members of the public that met with us, I want to, again, thank you. Um, your feedback was very valuable and very helpful for us to determine the path for FOIA.gov. Some of the things that we considered um, it are a, uh, a improvement or um, additional functionality that would assist aid requesters on getting to the right record or right agency um, from FOIA.gov. I call it like a FOIA wizard. Uh, or like a TurboTax for FOIA. Um, and we found that there, there's a lot of great value there. We looked into status, also the 10X project. Um, and we're just wrapping it up, but looking at this as a, what can we do now um, immediately, some low weight design uh, updates, uh, as well as what we can do in the short term and what we should do more long term. So we look forward to uh, finishing this uh, and then building on it, and, and, and we'll share our uh, our findings and next developments going forward. Uh, before we move on, I don't have a slide on this. Another update for FOIA.gov that we are looking forward to is um, adding a uh, web presence for the Chief FOIA Officer Council on the site. As you know, FOIA.gov is the central site for government-wide uh, FOIA administration, and so we wanted to increase the, our web presence. And so we look forward to hopefully by next meeting, either having launched that or demo it. Um, and so stay tuned for that. Next slide. Finally, uh, some forthcoming resources uh, that we are excited to that we'll, we'll launch this year. Uh, we just start our initiative of developing new e-learning training courses that will be available um, to all of it, all you, your agency, agencies, um, to load into your e-learning um, uh, platforms, uh, and hopefully we're trying to develop a, a public version that we, you know, the same version, but a public way of also including on our websites. 
uh, but we're focusing on three different trainings. So there'll be three separate training modules. One will be a brief training module for senior executives um, in their unique role in FOIA administration. Uh, Another will be a, a, a module focused more like a 30, 45 minute module focused on all agency personnel. And then finally, a much more in depth two to three hour course that goes over all of the procedural and exemption requirements for FOIA for FOIA professionals. So we hope that this will be an easy and a good way of providing consistent FOIA training to all uh, all, all members of your workforce, uh, as I said, FOIA is everyone's responsibility, and we hope that this will help uh, your agencies um, in, in raising both awareness and then having substantive FOIA training for your FOIA professionals. And as uh, we've, we've, uh, we, we hope to issue this sooner, but we're still working on and will issue this year our, our FOIA self-assessment toolkit. Next slide. Finally, as, I, as we wrap up, I just wanted to um, make raise, raise awareness to uh, the other uh, resources that we're continuing to update that are available to you. The guide to the FOIA is, uh, was completely fully updated in 2019. We'll have another full update done this year. Um, we update on a rolling basis um, based off a two year cycle. Uh, but in the, but we're also continuously uh, and on a regular basis updating our summaries of court decisions, which you should supplement with the guide um, for any new decisions that come out before a certain guide chapter has been updated. Of course, we're always available for training. So if your agency needs specific training, uh, we are happy to accommodate that. Um, as in addition to the the, uh, the established training, government wide training that we we provide. Um, and we continue to be here uh, to provide individual guidance. So if uh, your agency has any questions, or, uh, please do reach out to us on our FOIA counselor service line, 202514 FOIA. Next slide. Uh, I will, uh, since we're, I'll pause if there's any questions, maybe just a minute, but um, I think since we're a little bit behind, maybe I'll just then pass it over to you, Alina. Okay, thanks, Bobby. I'll try to get us back on track. Um, some really great updates, thanks. And it's exciting to hear the uh, way guide is getting updated too. That's a great resource. Um, next slide, please. And another next slide. So here come our updates. Uh, I wanted to brief you on some uh, activities that we've been engaged in since the last time we met in April of this year. Uh, first, I wanted to talk a little bit about our dispute resolution program, uh, which uh, in which we do not dictate solutions or tell agencies they have to turn over records. Uh, we sometimes joke we are not the FOIA police. We cannot write tickets for non-compliance or failure to participate in our mediation process. Our mediation services are completely voluntarily voluntary, and we have had both agencies and requesters participate or decline to participate. Most often, we act as a facilitator to help agencies and requesters better understand the issues and the other party's position. The statute specifically says our mediation services are a non-exclusive alternative to litigation, and we try to prevent litigation by explaining the FOIA process, including how a search was conducted or an explanation of the records withheld under exemption cited. There's nothing in the statute that prevents a requester from filing a suit after going through our mediation process. Once a case is in litigation, we do not get involved. Uh, a number of requesters have told us um, that even if uh, they were not successful uh, in our mediation process, they have at least understood uh, more about the information that was being withheld and understood more about the agency's position. So there is definitely a lot of value to what we do. Uh, I have some stats that I've, I'm displaying here on this slide. I just wanted to share with you um, that from fiscal year 2020 to fiscal year 2021, we experienced a 4% increase in the cases we logged in. Uh, we experienced a small increase in the number of cases closed, but we kept up. So I'm very proud of um, our mediation team for doing that, uh, despite the challenges of the pandemic. Uh, we were able to keep our backlog uh, down um, and fairly steady. We ended fiscal year 2020 with 27 cases in our backlog and 30 cases in our backlog fiscal year 2021. Uh, and that's still significantly down from a backlog of 153 cases that we had in fiscal year 2019. 
Also, uh, we were able to close all of our cases pending from fiscal year 2020 this past year. And we shrunk the age of our oldest complex case with the oldest now pending at 237 days. Next slide, please. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to revisit an important topic, uh, estimated dates of completion, EDCs. In 2019 and early 2020, OGIS conducted an assessment of EDCs that we were finishing just as the pandemic moved away operations from government offices to homes. As we noted when we released uh, the assessment in March 2020, months of research and review of hundreds of OGIS cases went into our report. And the report did not reflect the pandemic's challenges of physical distancing from computers and record systems that came after March 2020. Despite the timing, OGIS believed that the topic was important enough to release uh, our assessment in March of 2020, particularly since we knew that regardless of the pandemic's effects, requesters were still entitled to EDCs. We recognize that in the early days of the pandemic, our assessment, our accompanying advisory opinion, and FOIA Ombuds Observer package may have been lost in the shuffle. Uh, but the issue of EDCs has only become more relevant in the, uh, with the passage of time. And we have seen that through the requests which have come uh, to our attention this past fiscal year. In our role as the FOIA Ombudsman, we saw the number of requests for OGIS assistance involving delays jump 73% in fiscal year 2021. That in itself may not be surprising given the extraordinary times we have been experiencing for the last 20 months. But what was more surprising to us is that for 85% of these requests for our, our assistance involving delays, a requester asked for and was unable to obtain an EDC. While delays are understandable in the COVID-19 environment, particularly with regard to requests for paper records uh, that are stored, for example, in our federal record centers or that are classified, agencies must provide EDCs upon request to comply with the FOIA statute. And it's important to note that an estimated date of completion is just that, an estimate, not a guarantee that the agency will respond or will have responded by that date. And EDCs are subject to change and can be adjusted over time. In our role as the FOIA Ombudsman, we have observed that the EDC requirement and the law sparks significant frustration among requesters and federal agencies. FOIA requesters who are unable to obtain EDCs or in some cases any information whatsoever from agencies about the status of their requests frequently contact OGIS for assistance. Likewise, frustrated FOIA processors have told us about the challenges of providing requesters with EDCs, particularly when faced with growing backlogs. More than half of FOIA processors as part of eight OGIS assessments of agency FOIA programs said that they sometimes or rarely or never provide EDCs when requested. So we're taking this opportunity today to call your attention to our March 2020 compliance assessment, advisory opinion, FOIA Ombuds Observer package. Uh, we noted in our advisory opinion that if a FOIA requester is able to establish that an agency has a pattern or practice of failing to provide EDCs, a court may find that the agency has violated the FOIA. And we hope that the information is provided in these documents will assist FOIA programs in complying with the EDC requirement. Our recommendations include that agencies should ensure that online tools that provide EDCs function properly, provide the most up-to-date information possible, and provide contact information for the FOIA program. And the agencies should use average processing times for simple and complex requests to help determine EDCs. Next slide, please. Our fourth recommendation is where you, chief FOIA officers and FOIA professionals out there watching us today come in and where I ask you for your help. We recommended that chief FOIA officers should ensure that FOIA professionals have the necessary resources to provide EDCs to FOIA requesters. If necessary, chief FOIA officers should use their statutory authority to recommend to the head of the agency adjustments to agency for the practices, policies, personnel, technology, and funding. As we said in our assessment, support from agency leadership is crucial to their success in meeting FOIA statutory requirements. 
including providing ABCs upon request. Chief FOIA officers who are required under FOIA to support efficient and appropriate compliance with FOIA and recommend improvements to implementation are in the best position to ensure, ensure such support. Please spend some time in the next several weeks in this space to ensure that your agencies are providing EDCs upon request, and if they are not, reviewing changes to ensure future compliance. Next slide, please. Since 2014, OGIS has been working closely with the Archivist of the United States to improve the administration of FOIA through the work of the FOIA Advisory Committee, which I chair and which Bobby also sits on as a member. The committee brings together members of the FOIA community from inside and outside of government to collaboratively identify the greatest challenges in the administration of FOIA and develop recommendations for and suggest best practices to the archivist. We have had three complete terms of the committee thus far. Uh, three terms have produced a total of 30 recommendations and over 35 best practices. They cover a broad range of topics, all designed to improve the FOIA process and access to government documents. Uh, on this slide, they are grouped by general topics. We are currently in the fourth term of the committee, 2020 through 2022, uh, and the four formed subcommittees, legislation, process, technology, and classification have been meeting on a regular basis. Some of the subcommittees have further broken down into working groups, some of which span more than one subcommittee, and they are considering a broad range of topics, including FOIA fees, the design and authority of OGIS, uh, also known as reimagining OGIS, one of my favorite topics, agency FOIA program funding, first party requests, I'll touch on that briefly uh, a little bit later on as well, clarity and consistency of processing. And some members are also taking a look at past committee recommendations to see whether they, any of them can be amplified or refined, including training, Section 508 compliance, e-discovery, and online databases for commonly requested records. I'm excited to report the current committee uh, has already delivered to the archivist the 31st recommendation unprecedented in the past. All the recommendations were at the end of the term. This was mid-term. Uh, mid the recommendation states that Congress should adopt rules or enact legislation to establish procedures for affecting public access to legislative branch records in the possession of congressional support offices and agencies modeled after those procedures contained in the FOIA. These should include requirements for proactive disclosure of certain information, procedures governing public records, requests for records, time limits for responding to requests, exemptions to be narrowly applied, and an appeal from any initial decision to deny access. OGIS delivered the recommendation to the archivist after the committee's vote at its June 10th, 2021 meeting. And our next step is uh, one that we're currently working on. We're uh, working out the best way for the archivist to convey that recommendation to Congress. So please stay tuned for that. Next slide, please. We have created a recommendations dashboard in order to keep track of the committee's work to date, which we update periodically. Um, and I'm proud to report that thanks to OGIS's hard work, 10 recommendations have already been completed. 15 recommendations are in progress, and another six are pending action, meaning roll up our sleeves and start working on those as soon as we are able. And I just want to take a minute to thank Bobby and uh, all of the staff at OIP. We've had an extremely collaborative relationship in uh, bringing to fruition many of these four advisory committee recommendations, and I'm very grateful for the partnership and look forward to continuing um, to move things along. So um, hopefully we can have all 31 recommendations completed one day. Next slide, please. So this past uh, uh, six months or so since we last met um, in April 2021, we have published two additional reports I wanted to highlight. Um, one of the issue assessments that we published in August of this year represents a very successful collaboration among the FOIA Advisory Committee, OIB, and OGIS. 
The committee recommended that OGIS and OIP ask agencies to identify common categories of records requested frequently under the FOIA and or Privacy Act by or on behalf of individuals seeking records about themselves. It's recommendation number 2020-14. To fulfill that recommendation, OIP asked agencies that received more than 50 FOIA requests in fiscal year 2019 to answer the following question in their 2021 Chief FOIA Officer reports. Does your agency frequently receive common categories of first party requests? If so, please describe the types of requests and if your agency has explored establishing alternative means of access to these records outside of the FOIA process. OGIS reviewed these responses of 70 agencies that answered the question in their 2021 CFO reports and analyzed individual agency and component efforts regarding categories of information that were the subject of first party requests and agency processes for responding to such requests. And we made four major findings, which you can find in our report. I've linked it here. Uh, the first finding, the majority of agencies that submitted CFO reports frequently receive first party requests. Not great chalk, I suppose. The second finding is that first party requesters frequently request general categories of records maintained by most agencies. That was kind of interesting. So some of them are more routine requests for records that span uh, many different agencies. The first, a third finding is that first party requesters frequently seek access to unique records maintained by specific agencies. And the last finding was that sub agencies do provide alternative non FOIA means of access to first party records. Recognizing that there's no one size fits all approach to alternative processes for obtaining first party records. OGIS recommended that agencies examine closely all of the records that they generate, collect and or maintain and seek creative ways to provide non FOIA access to first party records whenever possible. OGIS also recommended that agencies use their websites to explain in plain language the steps requesters should take to obtain access to first party records. Finally, a note that a working group of the process subcommittee of the current term of the committee, I referenced that earlier, is studying the issue of first party requests to see whether additional recommendations may be warranted. Next slide, please. For the fourth consecutive year, we partnered with our colleagues in the Chief Records Officer's Office to ask several questions in the Records Management Self-Assessment, RMSA. Our partnership with the PROS Office has allowed us to expand our review of agency FOIA policies and procedures by asking targeted questions that help us identify potential compliance issues that merit further exploration. Results from several RMSA surveys have provided us with the foundation for additional OGIS assessments, and they're all available on our website. The COVID-19 pandemic's effects on FOIA processing and the use of e-discovery are among the topics in our latest report. The RMSA survey for 2020, administered to agency records officers between January and March of 2021 by NARA's close office, included seven key questions regarding FOIA administration. Key results highlighted in this assessment uh, include the following. Nearly half of all respondents, 49%, reported that the COVID-19 pandemic disrupted their agency's ability to respond to FOIA requests. A majority of respondents, 80%, whose FOIA programs were disrupted reported that the agency's paper records were inaccessible due to office closures, while nearly half, 46%, reported that agency staff were not available to search for records. A majority of respondents, 72%, reported that their agencies worked directly with requesters to tailor their requests for more efficient processing during the pandemic. A majority of respondents, again, 72%, reported that their agencies use e-discovery tools to search for records when responding to FOIA and or legal discovery. Of the agencies that reported using e-discovery tools, a significant majority, 91%, reported their agencies use e-discovery tools for FOIA responses involving requests for email records. Of the respondents who reported that their agencies do not use e-discovery tools to search for records, Roughly half reported that such tools are not available at their agencies. A majority of respondents, 51%, reported that their agency records officer and chief FOIA officer work together 
on information technology requirements that benefit both programs. And half, 50% reported that their training programs address the importance and relationship between it and records management. That's something that uh, OGIS strives to underline uh, as often as possible, that important relationship. So I encourage all of you to take a look at our two reports when you have a chance. Next slide, please. I wanted to highlight two upcoming events that I hope you can all join us for. Uh, the first is actually tomorrow. The archivist has already uh, spoken about it. I wanted to provide the NARA YouTube link. Uh, please join us as Professor Margaret Cuoco, who is a former advisory, FOIA, FOIA advisory committee member, uh, is, is going to be interviewed by current FOIA advisory committee member, Tom Sussman, on her new book uh, called Saving the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, I have included that link to the NARA YouTube live stream for the event. And join us. Um, also, the next full FOIA advisory committee meeting will be taking place on Thursday, December 9th, starting at 10 a.m. Uh, we don't have uh, Eventbrite or NARA YouTube information yet, but please visit our website uh, and uh, we will have more information as we get closer to that date. Next slide, please. So, I'm very excited to report that we are growing our compliance team. Uh, please check out USA Jobs for our GS-13 Management and Program Analyst position. Uh, it opened earlier this week on November 15th and closes November 23rd. Uh, I've included the link uh, there for it. And please tell all of your friends and the federal family about it and encourage uh, everyone to apply. So we're very excited about uh, the, the possibility of some great applicants that I'm sure we're going to get. Next slide, please. So I also had a slide for questions, but I'm looking at my time and I think we're actually managing to catch up Bobby. So I think we're getting back on track. Believe that uh, next up, we're uh, going to turn it over to our two committees to start giving reports. And uh, I'm checking in to see if we've got our co-CACI uh, co-chairs uh, on deck ready to start presenting. Hi, Mike. Hello. Okay, so I don't know if, if uh, your co-chair is available, but um, I will just pause for a second. I don't see any questions or anyone pinging me that there are any burning questions right now. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it over to, to Mike to go ahead and uh, turn and tell us about what's going on in your committee. Great, thank you, Alina, so much. Uh, just making sure I'm not on mute, since that seems to be the uh, the latest uh, craze with all these meetings. The uh, uh, can you hear me now guy is now more appropriate than ever when using the commercials. Uh, but my name is Mike Bell, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the uh, Committee on Cross-Agency Collaboration and Innovation. Uh, my co-chair is Abby Mosheim of uh, CPSC. Uh, she should be addressing you at the end of our uh, committee's presentation today. Uh, in my uh, day job, uh, I'm the FOIA officer for the Office of the Secretary of Transportation. Uh, luckily, transportation issues haven't been in the news much lately, so I've had plenty of time to devote uh, to the committee. Uh, but all joking aside, uh, I would like to point out that all the members on this committee and the technology committee all have day jobs that they are spending extra time on for these committees. Uh, really because they want to give a little extra to improve the FOIA, FOIA process. Uh, as uh, Professor Cloca's book uh, says, it may need some fixing, and these committees are, have gotten together with people giving up their own time uh, to try to help out a little bit. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, Kokaki uh, was first announced actually last year at the October 2020 Chief FOIA Officer Council meeting. And over the next few months after that, uh, we received volunteers from all over the government. Uh, I think we're up to uh, 13 federal agencies right now, and uh, we're still receiving new members even up through last week. Uh, so uh, if anyone wants to join or they know someone in their office who might be interested, uh, please just contact us or OGIS, and we would be glad to uh, take on more members. Uh, our committee first met uh, back in March of this year. And the first order of business was to come up with a better acronym than COCACI. 
but actually, uh, what happened was it soon grew on us, and uh, the phrase went from uh, awkward to actually a little beloved. So we've stuck with Kokaki. Uh, but when I took a look at uh, what we've done so far, uh, we could almost call ourselves, you know, the Build on Better Committee. Uh, you know, that might be a little derivative at this point. Uh, but we really have been building on the work of a lot of other uh, offices, committees, um, just to try to uh, improve and spread what's been going on in the FOIA world. Uh, the committee started out first building on the work of the 2018-2020 uh, FOIA Advisory Committee, uh, especially the recommendation number 16, uh, which is sort of our founding precept. Uh, basically, the, the committee asked the Chief FOIA Officer Council uh, to commit a committee quote, for cross-agency collaboration and innovation. And that's where we got the name, Kokaki. And basically the recommendation had three main points. And you'll see as we get into our subcommittees, uh, we have subcommittees that uh, mesh pretty well with uh, the three main recommendations. Uh, the first part of that recommendation 16 uh, was they wanted to research and propose a cross-agency grant program and other revenue resources. Uh, we especially want to focus on small agency offices because uh, they sometimes uh, don't get the benefits of uh, economies of scale that some of the larger ones do. Uh, one of the other uh, recommendations, or part of that recommendation, was to uh, promote initiatives for a uh, clear career trajectory for FOIA professionals. You know, we got the Government Information Specialist Job Series, and we just want to try to uh, recruit and retain the best people. Uh, in this career field. So we have a subcommittee for that. Uh, and then the final part of the recommendation was uh, to try to align agency resources uh, with a commitment to transparency. And uh, that really got our committees started. Uh, but however, we've also been building on the uh, Chief Foy Officer Technology Committee. Uh, you're gonna be hearing from them uh, shortly, hopefully, uh, and just hearing all the amazing things that they've been doing. And then finally, we've been also building on uh, all the hard work that the FOIA offices around the government uh, have done over the last uh, 20 months or so during this pandemic. Uh, we have a committee for that, as well, subcommittee for that as well, that we're trying to just build on what's uh, been accomplished uh, for what seems like forever, but it's only been 20 months. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and like I said, to accomplish this, we have uh, three uh, subcommittees. Uh, we're going to be hearing from each of them uh, in turn shortly, uh, so I'm not going to uh, spoil their presentations, uh, but you can see their uh, main uh, themes or goals uh, written on the slide here. Uh, for the GIS uh, subcommittee, they want to review and promote initiatives uh, for career trajectories for FOIA professionals. As I said, recruit and retain. We also want to keep the best people. Uh, you know, sometimes people will leave the career field and we want to try to find a way to uh, reward them and motivate them to stay in this uh, field. Uh, then we have the pandemic FOIA, pandemic virtual FOIA office subcommittee. And as everyone knows, FOIA offices uh, and everyone has been forced to adjust over this last uh, 20 months. And we're going to have to adjust again now that we're going to back to the office soon. We're going to have to merge the virtual FOIA office uh, with uh, the office office. And then finally, we have the FOIA Resources Subcommittee. Basically, we just want to uh, look at and share, you know, what resources are out there, what, what can we take advantage of, and then just how to use it. So all three of these subcommittees are right now gathering information and thinking of ways to get that information out to federal agencies. And we all know that there's, you know, there's a lot of good information, a lot of good processes out there, uh, but we also know it's also tough to get that information uh, through the bureaucracy to all the employees who really need it. And the, the committee is really looking out for a true long lasting cross agency collaboration. Uh, if this committee were to simply uh, compile a bunch of solutions, uh, pass them on in some kind of report and then disband, uh, Kukaki would be a failure then uh, because we wanna create a, a permanent infrastructure to access and share all the good ideas and information that's out there. Uh, so now I'd like to go ahead and uh, turn it over to our subcommittees and hear uh, some of the good ideas that they've come up with so far. And we'd like to start with the Government Information Services uh, Professionalism Subcommittee. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everybody. Next slide, please. 
Next slide, please. My name is Madeline Van Nostrand, the co-chair of the GIS Professionalization Subcommittee. Today, I'm gonna to go over the purpose of our subcommittee and our long-term objectives. Then I'll hand it over to Nicole Reminter, who will discuss where our subcommittee is now and our plan deliverable. The GIS Professionalization Subcommittee was assigned to review and promote initiatives for clear career trajectories for FOIA professionals, building on the Government Information Specialist Job Series and in coordination with existing agency efforts. Before I go into more details on our subcommittee, I'd like to briefly outline the history of the GIS Job Series. The Government Information Specialist, or GIS for short, was a position created in 2012 by the Office of Personnel Management as the 306 job series. OPM largely left it up to agencies how to implement the new job series. The Obama administration recognized that this new job series elevated the importance of the work performed by those in the federal government who are responsible for realizing the president's vision of an open and transparent government. This subcommittee aims to examine how the GIS job series can continue to be elevated. This subcommittee will examine future cross-agency support necessary for GIS career development and advancement, and will inform the development of performance standards for the GIS job series. Next slide, please. Through cross-agency collaboration, this subcommittee will specifically review the following areas, recruitment strategies, hiring and retention strategies, uniform pay scale assignments and key competencies for civil servants, and professional certification testing. Additional areas may be examined if identified by the research and data gathering stages. And that's all I have for today. Now over to Nicole, thank you. Thanks so much, Madeline. Good morning. My name is Nicole Rementer. I am an attorney advisor with the National FOIA Office at the Environmental Protection Agency and co-chair of the GIS Professionalization Subcommittee. Recomm recommendation 16 from the FOIA Advisory Committee's 2020 term report gave us some very important goals and highlighted the importance of supporting FOIA professionals and the Government Information Specialist Series. To that end, the submit subcommittee has recognized that our eventually proposed solutions should be data driven. Our initial efforts aim to investigate the underlying obstacles and their effect on GIS career development and mobility in both the short and long terms. We are currently developing a survey of FOIA professionals, have interviewed and will continue interviews of FOIA leaders and experts. All of these efforts support our information and data gathering necessary to develop a thoroughly developed white paper that the subcommittee will present to the Kokaki Committee and Chief FOIA Officers Council. This white paper will propose recommendations for next steps for the subcommittee that will contribute to the Kokaki's implementation of Recommendation 16. That is our report on the progress of the GIS subcommittee. Thank you all for your time and attention and next slide, please. Good morning, my name is Shantae Stanley and I am the chair of the Pandemic Virtual FOIA Offices Subcommittee. Next slide, please. The Pandemic Virtual FOIA Offices Subcommittee was created basically to analyze and review the capability of the FOIA professionals, professionals to work in a virtual location during the pandemic. So we will be working to gather the lessons learned and best practices for um, teleworking, um, not only during the pandemic, but we also want to build on um, what OIP has done. And um, I know that GAO is also working this issue as well. So we want to go ahead and build upon that to make sure that we can sustain this post COVID as well. Next slide, please. Long term, what we'll do is we will create a um, the lessons learned from teleworking and we'll make recommendations as to what the best practices are um, that we have already examined 
um, during COVID. The progress that we have made is we're now framing our questions now to create the sur survey. We want to compile um, answers as to what the agencies have learned as far as um, you know, technology wise, how hard it was to, you know, move from an in office environment to a virtual environment. So we are planning to publish a list of the best practices, what was learned, and we're going to focus on the tactics, the techniques and procedures that were effective in making the transition from the in office to a virtual office. But we also want to be able to sustain that post COVID. And that is all I have. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Good morning, everyone. I am Brandon Gaylord. I am the chair for the FOIA Resources Subcommittee. I am also the FOIA director and uh, officer for HHS. Next slide, please. The FOIA Resources Subcommittee is really kind of focusing on three to four different areas. The first thing we want to do, we can actually really use your help on this, is we're looking for the different types of resources out there, um, specifically anything that would be outside of the usual FTE hiring process. Uh, we've already found a lot of agencies are using um, some, some really uh, good ideas, things like Tiger Teens in the department offices, leveraging areas like pathways, internships, and so we're learning a lot, um, but I think there's a lot more out there. So if you have things that you use in your office that you found useful, please reach out to us and we'll definitely uh, try to incorporate those in our plan. And we're also trying to compile and create reference materials that will be kind of a user guide to getting involved in some of these. So if uh, you're looking to set up maybe an internship program for a certain part of your office, you know, kind of helping helping you get the tools you need to start that process by following somebody who's already gone down that path before. We're looking to also identify opportunities where we can standardize our resources across government agencies. And again, kind of looking for that agency that, that's done something, done it well, and allowing them to kind of blaze that path for us and um, build out kind of the points <clears throat> as to how they've done that. So the rest of us can just kind of draft behind them. And we're looking to, uh, we're still not quite sure how we want to um, post this and, and disseminate this information, but we do want to kind of be a, a reference source where you as a federal agency can go and see what's out there, what's available, and, and choose the best uh, path for you to go. And the last thing we're going to look at is identifying and highlighting resources that are already standardized. And as Mike mentioned, uh, you know, a lot of smaller agencies out there don't have resources of other big agencies. So we're hoping that we'll be able to put some things out there that are already in place. And you know, if you're a, a small two or three person shop, uh, you know, then you can you can just hop over and uh, see what's already available. And this is something where, while the federal resource or the FOIA resources committee is built mainly facing federal agencies, we think that the ultimate goal of this really is better customer service, uh, backlog reduction. That's still kind of the overarching mission here is to allow us to. Uh, provide more resources and uh, better resource, uh, better use the resources we have and diversify our resources to make sure that we're equipped for uh, where's, where FOIA is going in the next five to 10 years. I will turn it over to Avi who will rack up, wrap up the COCACI presentation. Next slide, please. Hi, thank you so much. I'm Avi Moshaim. I'm the co-chair of COCAFI with Mike Bell, and I'm also the Consumer Product Safety Commission's Chief FOIA Officer. And I want to thank Mike, Madeline, Shante, Brandon, um, all of you for doing wonderful presentations and every member of the committee for all of the hard work that you're doing. We've come a long way this year, as you can see, with all of the, the work that we're doing and the deliverables that we have in mind. Um, and I just I really appreciate each and every one of you. Um, so just to wrap it up, we are three subcommittees, GIS, Pandemic, and Resources. We are working to improve our collaborative efforts across the federal government, examining the current state of the GIS profession with the goal of harmonizing recruitment, retention, pay, and development of the career. And we're also taking lessons learned from the pandemic that we're currently in, but moving slowly out of 
um, and to see how they apply to the future of FOIA offices in what will most likely be a mixed environment of virtual and in-office work. And we're also reviewing the common resources that we have and um, uncovering existing needs in federal FOIA offices with a goal to standardize resources, improve access and efficiency. Um, and with that all said, we could always use new members. So if anyone is interested in joining COCACI, we would welcome you with open arms. Um, we have a lot of great members with great ideas and we know that uh, people out there have even more great ideas. So we'll put those ideas together and work to solve all of the um, challenges that are facing FOIA offices, which are really opportunities uh, to improve. So thank you so, so much. Thank you, Abby, and thank you, Kokaki. Um, really enjoyed your presentation. I just want to echo the, the gratitude that Abby um, expressed um, for the work of all the committee members and um, all of you that presented today. Uh, three topics that are at the core of any agency's success in FOIA administration. So uh, just wanted to reemphasize uh, Abby's message. Please reach out to us uh, for um, uh, participation or volunteers for the Kokaki. Uh, next, I'd like to turn it over to our technology committee. Uh, introduce our co-chairs, Michael Sarich and Eric Stein. Michael and Eric, over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Well, good morning. My name is Eric Stein. I'm one of the co-chairs of the technology committee. I'm going to turn it over to Mike for the opening comments. Next slide, please. Yeah. Good morning. Thank you all. What a great presentation by Mike, Abby, and the Kokaki team. I'd be uh, the group is really taking off, and I'd be remiss if I didn't um, say that I'm really impressed with their work and their contributions to, to, the, uh, to the community. The Chief FOIA Officers Council Tech Committee was created in response to a need identified by the FOIA Advisory Committee. It seeks to bring members from across the FOIA and tech world together to understand the state of technology tools being used in FOIA programs, kind of find the bright stars, um, the best practices, and take that collective wisdom and share it across the federal FOIA family. The FOIA Advisory Committee recognized, and I think we all agree, that uh, together we can drive improvements in FOIA processing through active dialogue, deep dives on important research areas, and embrace the diverse perspectives from agencies, both big and small. So to that end, we have 39 members from at least 23 different uh, departments and agencies. Next slide, please. So we focused our work right now around seven groups, and I'm really looking forward to, to uh, Matt Pollack sharing a bit about just one of the products we've produced so far and on video redaction, and Gorka Garcia Malone from uh, NIH pre previewing a coming attraction on FOIA case processing. So over to Eric to share some of the uh, FY21 highlights. Okay, next slide, please. All right, good morning again. Our committee has been in existence for almost three years now, um, goes fast. And we have uh, start, we started out with the broad mandate and started to work through the seven different working groups that Mike just mentioned. Uh, and we'll be talking and showing some of our deliverables uh, in a few minutes. Throughout the past fiscal year, we managed to accomplish uh, several things despite the pandemic and have several other um, pretty big uh, things coming up for fiscal year 22 and beyond. Uh, the first thing uh, here li listed on uh, the slide is the we completed work on our recommendations from a February 2020 report. Uh, one of the things we committed to was going through the recommendations and actions that uh, we've developed and figuring out what can we do and uh, what if anything else is needed. So we completed the work on those recommendations uh, in this fiscal year and we're moving on now to the next, uh, well, listed here are charters and uh, the work that we've scoped out through each of the working groups. Second bullet here notes that we had an AI event, uh, and this is important for a whole host of reasons. Our committee strives to raise awareness uh, of technology throughout the federal FOIA community, uh, and that's introducing concepts like AI, machine learning, uh, and uh, e-discovery tools, and so on. So this event was great. It, it had it provided an opportunity to provide an overview of artificial intelligence, what it is and isn't, uh, and how it may apply to FOIA or in, in the future. Uh, we'll be doing similar events um, um, this year and beyond as well. We'll talk about that a little later in the presentation. The third bullet here notes that we posted our charters publicly. A uh, link is available. Uh, it's on the OGIS website, uh, and the we've been working to to uh, execute the different deliverables on in those charters. 
Uh, you'll be seeing one or two of the papers, and we'll talk about one of them today and preview another one uh, in a few minutes, like I mentioned. We participated in two different OIP best practices workshop, and these sessions are important for us in the technology committee because it gives us a better understanding of what federal agencies are and are not doing, the challenges they face, and how can we apply technology to, to those challenges. We, of course, briefed at the April 2020, 2021 meeting of this group to share our updates at that time. And before we prepared this presentation today, we went back to that presentation to see what did we brief you on. Uh, so for those of you who saw that presentation, it's nice to see you again, nice to have you with us. And for those of you who weren't there, welcome. Uh, and thank you for all the support you're providing to your FOIA programs. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn over to Mike and next slide. Great, thank you, Eric. So the committee has published a couple of great papers, one on video redaction and another one on searches, two of the, two of the areas that we wanted to, to focus on with our uh, seven working groups. And more papers are on the way from the other five uh, working groups. I'd like to focus first on one of the papers we published before we pivot to a coming attraction. So first off, it is my great pleasure to introduce Matthew Pollack. Matt's the Chief of Disclosure Law and Judicial Actions Branch at the U.S. Customs and Border Protection. But moreover, Matt's a leader in the field of FOIA tech, and he led our efforts to publish our first ever working paper on video redactions. So Matt will uh, give us kind of a high-level overview of the paper, talk about delivering resources uh, for the FOIA community. So Matt, uh, over to you, sir. Thanks very much, Michael, and good morning to everybody. Um, as uh, Michael in indicated, you know, our group was uh, pressed to um, address a issue of growing concern, uh, which is how agencies should approach requests for video records. Um, and I mentioned that it's a, an issue of growing concern for, for two main reasons. First, um, the, there is a growth of video records in federal agencies across the board. We see that, and of course, over the course of the pandemic, so many more meetings, including this one, uh, are being held virtually. There are recordings of those meetings and people can request those. A second is that there has been an increased scrutiny on uh, law enforcement agents and the way that they uh, perform their duties. And so many agencies, including my own at U.S. Customs and Border Protection, um, are integrating uh, body cameras into our uh, law enforcement personnel uh, practices. And so there's a, a significant increase in the number of videos that are being recorded in, in that setting as well. The second reason why this has become such a, a pressing issue is that courts have uh, made an about face in the last several years, whereas before they've, they acknowledged that maybe agencies don't have the proper technology that they need to redact videos. Um, courts have, have changed that view. Um, they've, they've acknowledged that uh, most people have the ability to uh, redact videos in their pockets via cell phone, uh, and so it's it's almost unreasonable to assume that the, the government no longer can can have that that technology. One court said that uh, you know he, he the, a judge has a, a teenager who can put cat faces on the videos of his, uh, of his friends. Uh, why can't the federal government just make that a blur? Uh, and uh, and and it makes sense. Lots of other courts have kind of followed suit in in requiring uh, agencies to to possess this technology, and they've been looking beyond FOIA offices. They've been looking for the technology capabilities of the agency writ large, um, whether there's an Office of Public Affairs or Media Affairs that might have um, those, those types of capabilities. So um, they're, they're really holding the agencies responsible to addressing these records as they're creating them. So our uh, group uh, attempted to come up with a way to uh, provide some best practices for agencies to right size their video redaction programs. And we put together a list of, of best practices, and I, I just wanted to hit some of the highlights uh, here with you today. Um, you know, the, the first is making sure that you, you have the right people who are, um, you know, making, making these redactions. That could come from inside your own FOIA office. That could be um, meaning, that could mean training your, your current FOIA professionals. That could mean bringing in new ones and, and making sure that you highlight video redaction capabilities uh, in, in your skill sets. Um, that could also mean reaching outside your FOIA program to other agency personnel that might have that expertise and the right tools to be able to, to make those uh, redactions. And it could mean if you have a limited number of, of video redactions that, that you might need to make, um, that could mean reaching out to contractors to, to perform that work. Um, I know we did that when we first started our, our FOIA redaction program because we were a little bit behind the eight ball uh, in that uh, we had a request and we had no way to deal with those records, and so we had to reach out to contractors. 
Um, and, and that kind of highlights one of the other issues that, uh, that, that we recommend is getting started with your FOIA redaction, video redaction program as soon as your agency considers creating video records. Um, now, for most agencies, we've already been doing that, as I mentioned, in the, the Zoom, WebEx, and, and Microsoft Teams world of the pandemic. Um, but, but we really need to consider how we're going to approach that. Uh, and so that, that includes figuring out who's doing it, um, and that includes making sure that we have the tools to be able to do that. Um, there are lots of different um, technology tools that are available, whether, and that, that includes those that are fully featured and, and similar to what they use in the Hollywood movies, uh, and some of those that are much more simple and that are uh, web-based or cloud-based um, in, in CBP. Um, we've, we've transitioned from one of those fully featured systems that we determined we no longer needed anymore um, to one that was provided by actually some of the, the hardware manufacturers of, um, of our body cameras that can be used for all types of video. And it's, it's a much more simple interface and a much more cost effective one as well. Um, so there's, you have to make sure you have the right people, you have to have the right tools, and, and you want to make sure that you're, you're getting started. Um, the rest of our paper touches on other recommendations, um, including, you know, making sure you're aware of record retention schedules, making sure you're prepared to deal with the storage necessary to have a video redaction program. A video file is much larger than a PDF, uh, and so as you're making redactions, you need much more space on your servers. Um, being aware of what the time commitment is to redact videos. Uh, redacting a five-minute video might be 9,000 frames. Uh, and, and it's equivalent to redacting 9,000 pages of records. It doesn't seem like a lot when you say, oh, it's only five minutes, uh, but that can take much longer if you're going frame by frame to, to redact that information. So you have to make uh, stakeholders within the agency and stakeholders you know, in the requester community aware that uh, video redaction might take a, a different period of time to, to work on than, than standard uh, paper redactions. And all, all of this is, you know, Plan ahead. That's that's the the biggest recommendation that we can have. Make your considerations now, um, as as soon as you can. Um, we hope that uh, our paper at least provides some sort of blueprint for success um, for for agencies as they're preparing to to deal with video uh, records. But um, I also wanted to make a uh, an offer of of our uh, committee for any agency that's that's adding this. Um, if you have questions, if you would like to gather some additional insight from what we've learned during our research, please feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to help. Uh, and for those of you in the requester community, if you've had good or bad experiences um, with video records, we'd love to hear about them so that we can incorporate those uh, in our next set of recommendations when we put them together. So we're, we're always here and willing to assist. And uh, with that, I'm gonna kick it back to Michael, but uh, thanks very much, everyone. Matthew, thank you so much for that excellent kind of overview of our um, our video redaction paper. And it's worth highlighting a couple of um, and reemphasizing a couple of points that that Matt so capably pointed out. And that's that the FOIA Tech Advisory Committee is here for folks in the FOIA community, folks in the requester community, just folks who are looking for federal records. We're here to to work to um, you know if there's a federal record, the expectation is that under the FOIA we provide it regardless of whether it's a video or, or, or what it may be. And, you know, when these new technologies, newish technologies come, come about and when agencies adopt these, it's part of our gig to, to make sure that we're able to provide those. So we couldn't be happier with the work product um, and really look forward to continuing dialogue um, and continuing uh, to work with the rest of the folks in, in the, uh, the FOIA community. Um, so with that uh, established uh, attraction, we have a coming attraction. Uh, that I'm really, really excited about. So I'd like to kind of preview that coming attraction. So to do that, it's, it's my great pleasure to introduce Gorka Garcia Malone. Gorka leads the National Institutes of Health FOIA program. And as Mike Bell pointed out earlier in his presentation, given the events of the last year and a half, uh, you can imagine how busy uh, Gorka has been at NIH. But again, folks in the FOIA community coming together to, to give of, the, of their time to help others in the FOIA community, um, you know, and and Gork has been able to uh, lend his considerable talents to help us work on our uh, FOIA case processing paper. And so it's my pleasure to turn it over to him to, uh, to preview that coming attraction. Gorka? Good morning, Michael. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for that very warm introduction. Uh, I tell you, um, it's uh, although we're very busy at NIH, the work that's being done in this uh, committee and in our workers is critical. 
uh, and it's it's important to just prepare ourselves for for the coming waves of FOIAs. So so this work really does take precedence. Um, to tell you a little bit about myself, I started my career at the Food and Drug Administration, doing a lot of FOIA litigation. I've since taken the reins here at uh, the National Institutes of Health, and I manage the, the FOIA program here. I couldn't uh, go on before mentioning, mentioning other uh, folks involved in this uh, work group, and it's you, Michael, Michael Sarich, and Barbara Soil at the EA, Virginia Burke in the Peace Corps, and Danielle Adams at the Consumer Financial Protection Agency. And the first charge that this work group had was to come up with the top 10 questions about FOIA Express. We all have experience with FOIA Express, and we thought that we could share some of our experience with the FOIA community at large, that it would be helpful. Some of its um, pros, some of its cons. Um, it has significant advantages and some limitations. And we wanted to share that with folks before they committed to that particular tool. We, we prepared that paper. I think it was extremely helpful. Uh, we, we got good feedback. Uh, from the paper, and uh, then we turn to what would be our next assignment. You know, as, as sort of as we look within, we found that our common experience was that when it was time for us to choose a platform uh, to to uh, review records, to do case management and track cases, we found that in our experiences we felt essentially alone. We didn't know whether to go with a homegrown solution or with something off the shelf, commercial off the shelf. Uh, and we thought we'd spare everybody else that uh, that experience. Uh, the reality is that there's a lot of information out there now. It's just difficult to find. There are a lot of uh, platforms that are available that have different strengths and weaknesses. And so what we set out to do was to prepare a paper that explains what the advantages are of going with the COT solution and what questions you should, you should ask yourself, because not all COT solutions are created equal. right? So the paper that we're preparing and we're close to uh, completing it really deals with some of the advantages of COTS, which, for, for example, some of these commercial off-the-shelf solutions come baked in with really strong metrics, right? So this is the kind of information that the system can generate very quickly. You can use it to report up or to report down or to assess the health of the, of the, of the program, and you can do it almost instantaneously. So that's, that's definitely one of the strengths that these uh, platforms have. Uh, in addition, the COT solutions, especially those that are dedicated to FOIA, update themselves. You're not working with your IT department to try to catch up with, with the requirements of uh, changing laws and regulations. This is something that the companies themselves are leading. So it takes a lot of uh, responsibility off your shoulders. But really, primarily, the paper focuses on, on what you should be asking yourself when determining whether you should go with a COT solution, and if so, with which. As I said, some of these COT solutions uh, can be very expensive, uh, can be very complex, and have capabilities that you may or may not need. So it really focuses um, on first giving you a sense that this is well-trodden territory. We've all sort of gone through this. It explains some of the questions you should be asking yourself in terms of uh, you know, what specifications you may or may not want. And it also uh, just elucidates the fact that, again, you are not alone by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, we really encourage you to reach out to colleagues, uh, sister agencies, uh, departments, and us. Uh, we look forward to any questions you have in order to determine what, what solution is best for you. And of course, we're always very excited to see our membership grow. So please reach out to us if, if you'd like to participate in our work group. Um, but as I said, the work that uh, that's being done here is critical. The request volumes are ever increasing. The complexity is always increasing. And so you, you don't want to find yourself shopping for a COT solution uh, on your heels. You know, when you've been confronted with litigation, you realize that the system that you have can't do the job. So I hope you'll be in touch with us and that you'll find our work product useful. Thank you, Michael. Thanks so much, Gorka. And again, um, the work that these committees uh, have done and continue to do, being just exposed to them, have really assisted us here at the Veterans Health Administration in leveraging and maximizing our own COT solutions. So being able to work with uh, real leaders like uh, Danielle, Virginia, Gorka, uh, have really helped Barbara and I leverage um, 
the uh, the FOIA uh, the, the module that sorry that we that we use here at the Veterans Health Administration and has really made a difference as as we look to to meet um, meet leadership goals and then also um, compile the, that business information to kind of really tell the health of the program and you know where we're at. Thinking, talking about tools that we use and technology um, and kind of spreading the word and sharing the, sharing the wealth of information that we have in the in the tech space. We're really excited about what Eric is going to share next on a uh, FOIA technology showcase in February. So Eric, please. Great, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike, Gorka, and Matt uh, for those overviews there. Uh, before I go to the FOIA technology showcase, just wanna share, we also posted a FOIA search paper on our public website. Encourage uh, whether you are a FOIA practitioner or a member of the public to check out that paper. Uh, we did, uh, that working group did an excellent job of doing research about uh, FOIA capabilities at agencies, and we found that there were some disconnects between actual capabilities at agencies and what various members of the public thought agencies could do. For example, uh, some people thought that we could just do a search across all the databases and uh, tools at a federal agency in one place, and while some agencies have uh, a more advanced technology that allow for those types of capabilities. Most of the time, those are manual searches of multiple databases, multiple places for different types of records and information. So there are also some tips, uh, just uh, best practices or recommendations in that paper. So I encourage the FOIA search uh, paper if anyone wants to check that out. And, and with that, uh, the, the final item on this slide here is uh, we developed plans over this past year for the FOIA Technology Showcase. Uh, this is an event, a two-day event that we're planning in February 2022. Uh, currently, uh, there's uh, information available online. There's a, a link there for um, um, to it, and I'll come to that in a moment. What the FOIA Tech Showcase strives to do is to connect the, uh, government officials with capabilities out there in the private sector. And uh, we, we strive in this committee to raise awareness of technology in general, best practices, and keeping in mind that we work for the public and we wanna find the best possible way to respond to requests and, and with the growing uh, volume of information, data, records out there, uh, that, that challenge uh, continues to grow. We have to look for new and smarter ways to leverage technology and people to, to meet these demands. So the FOIA Tech Showcase is going to be a two day event. The first day is focused on uh, more practical applications of what technology and tools exist that are out there that would allow for uh, uh, federal agencies to maybe help with discovery of records, doing searches, doing redactions, uh, different COTS products or capabilities, tools, uh, APIs, and different um, applications that integrate technology. That, and, and we have a series of different topics uh, that we just, uh, that's on the uh, uh, RFI right now on SAM.gov that just shows on day one, we wanna hear what's in the practical realm right now. Day two is thinking bigger. It's what's the future of FOIA? What, what are we looking at in the next five, 10, 15 years with technology? And, and, and what, uh, and we have broader topics and themes. Um, it gives an opportunity for uh, the private sector to share its ideas about where, where it thinks FOIA could go uh, whereas day one's more focused on what do we need now um, in, in the immediate uh, term to address FOIA requests and the growing uh, volume of records and information out there. So we have the uh, link here for SAM doc, uh, for the FOIA, FOIA blog at OGIS, uh, the SAM.gov, we're taking RFIs, at, well, I should say the Department of Justice or um, NARA is taking the RFIs through November 23rd, at which point um, we will be preparing for the February 22 of, 2022 event for where the, uh, any vendors interested or private members of the private sector who want to present uh, can uh, provide a video and uh, be available for some Q&A with government officials who have questions about their capabilities. Next slide, please. This brings us to our next steps. When we get past our accomplishments, I'm very proud of the work uh, that our committee's done uh, remotely primarily. Uh, throughout the past fiscal year. The first thing we're looking at now is update our working group charters. Um, and if we have to update some deadlines, a few things slid over the past year. Uh, we, as you saw, we were able to get several things done. Uh, we're gonna look at, do we wanna devote our time and energy to some of those items from last year, or do we wanna pivot and 
uh, take on some additional topics. And here are some of the ones that have been shared with us. And we welcome your feedback on uh, different areas we, we should be looking at based on your agency needs. The first one is discussion of potential new working groups on data. A lot of talk about data scientists, AI, machine learning, uh, understanding how data is being used from a perspective of uh, maybe managing FOIA programs uh, and using metrics, but also how to manage data as it's being uh, pulled in response to requests and, and redaction uh, requirements. And uh, just data, uh, is uh, there's a whole lot there to unpack. Interoperability of IT tools. Uh, from over the past few years, we've gained in this, com this committee a very good understanding of the technical landscape out there throughout the 100 or so federal agencies uh, working on FOIA. And uh, so there, there are a lot of great applications out there, and sometimes the interoperability of tools is an issue. So looking at uh, the different capabilities that are out there so we could, at least, uh, we could help advise any agencies with questions or uh, uh, identify best practices moving forward. We want to dig deeper into technical agencies at issues, uh, technical issues at agencies, sorry. And uh, what we mean here is we started with, as I mentioned previously, a broader understanding of let's understand the federal landscape for FOIA. And now we're really getting into, all right, different agencies have different capabilities. We want to share best practices among them and identify ways, tools, uh, technical issues on the uh, considering um, the infrastructure at agencies, the, 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 the IT systems that they run, the, the sources of data that they have, the records, and where uh, can we add value as a committee in those uh, di at, at different agencies, because one size won't fit all. And finally, um, we're going to complete the pending deliverables that we ultimately keep in the charters. Uh, that's going to be, and we, like I said, we have to move those deadlines just a little bit in some cases, um, including some of the uh, updated papers. We just mentioned the FOIA Technology Showcase event in early 2022, uh, so we're very excited about that and connecting uh, federal FOIA practitioners to the private sector, uh, and I believe we're going to be as open and transparent as possible, trying to publish and post online as much information as we can about the events and the different tools being showcased there. With that, Mike, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thanks so much, Eric. appreciate that. So, as we talked about the, today, the Tech Committee is a creation of the FOIA Advisory Committee and is hopefully an example of putting those recommendations into action for the wider FOIA community. Um, so what we shared are just some of the things that we're working on. The Tech Committee is always looking for new ideas, new energy, new perspectives. And we do that to ensure that we're meeting the mandate from the FOIA Advisory Committee and either creating or identifying implementable ideas to help improve the operations of FOIA programs uh, government-wide. I think we've had some tremendous success so far. And it's really energizing when you're able to put those uh, those innovations into action, and I've seen them benefit my own FOIA program at VHA. We've had tremendous results, and I do give uh, a lion's share of the credit for the inspiration of my colleagues on, on the FOIA uh, Tech Committee. When I have questions, I always have an open ear, and um, I get you get a tremendous amount of support from your colleagues in terms of ideas and advice and guidance, because really, at the end of the day, we're all kind of doing the same thing. We're illuminating the operations of the federal government. And we do them in different agencies, but the mandate's the same. It's the same 20 days for me at, at, um, at VHA as it is for Eric at State or Gork at NIH or Matt at, at uh, Customs and Border Protection. So there we are. Um, so with that said, uh, we want to thank and acknowledge those mem the members of, the, of that team for all the hard work they've done, you know, along with the, the with their for their tireless work and the guidance of both Alina and Bobby along the way through this in, through this entire journey. And so with that said, Eric and I are open to questions, feedback and any input uh, folks would like to provide. And we can go to the next slide. Yeah, Mike, I would just add, we too are soliciting new members all the time. Uh, we had some members drop off over the past year. I think one of our colleagues from COCACI mentioned, uh, this is an additional responsibility uh, that people take on. And we're so grateful for the time that they commit to this uh, to this committee, which we think is very worth, worthwhile. I just wanna echo Bobby's thanks and appreciation to, to uh, uh, Mike's uh, uh, thanks and appreciation of Bobby and Alina and all the members of our committee who make this happen. So with that, um, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, uh, Eric and Mike and Gorka and Matt. You guys all did an outstanding job. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Martha Murphy, OGIS's Deputy Director, if uh, there have been any chat questions from our federal family colleagues. I haven't seen any, but I just want to make sure I didn't miss it. So we did have one question for Bobby about the training. 
Um, question is, will OIP e-learning courses be available to agencies who don't have e-learning platforms? Yes, and thank you for that question. Um, yes, we are planning to, so the, the, the initial goal is to have these in e-learning platform format, but we're also planning to have a version that won't have all the functionalities uh, that you have in an e-learning module, but have all the lessons um, that we'll post on our website that agencies um, would be able to use so that we can have it available both for those agencies that do have e-learning platforms and those that don't. Okay, great. Martha, thanks. There's, Anything uh, else? There's a question uh, uh, here from um, about how can one apply to be part of the committees? Um, and so um, if you're interested in the uh, the tech committee, uh, you can see Eric and um, and Michael's uh, email address, but you can also reach out to Alina and I, and, and we're happy to connect you with either committee. Um, glad to see that question. So hopefully that means we've inspired, the committee's inspired, and I, I just as inspired me, um, inspired other agencies to participate and uh, volunteer. It, it really, sh uh, uh, it's hard to believe that the tech committee is now three years old. Um, but a lot's been accomplished, and it's due to the great work of the, the members, and so I appreciate that. It looks like we had another question come in. Uh, when will the new e-learning courses be available? So we are working on developing them now. Um, we're Our plan is not to wait and release them all at once because uh, we want to get them uh, to in your hands as soon as possible. And so our, our current plan is to work on the, the ones that are smaller first, um, the executive, and roll that out as it's produced, hopefully um, by March, uh, then roll out the non-FOIA professional program personnel version. Um, and then a little bit after that, later in the year, um, but before the summer, we're hoping to be able to release the two to three hour version for FOIA professionals. Michael oh, Bell offered his uh, email in the chat, michael.bell1 at dot.gov for any potential Kokaki volunteers. Great. And I think the other question we had was a similar one, the estimated time frame for the training to be able, available to agencies. And we've already answered that. So thanks, Bobby. Thank you, Alina. Um, so if there's no other questions in the chat, uh, agency questions, I believe now we've reached the portion of our program where we can open the meeting to public comment section of our meeting, um, and we promise to leave time for that. Uh, we look forward to hearing from members of the public who have ideas or comments that they would like to share. I also want to remind everyone that you may also submit your written comments. Please email them to, excuse me, ogisopenmeeting at nara.gov. Any oral comments will be captured in the transcript of this meeting which we will post our, on our websites as soon as they are available. Okay. Um, so we will open up our telephone lines now to begin. So if I could turn to our event producer, Michelle, please uh, provide instructions for our listeners for how they can ask any questions or make any comments via telephone. Absolutely. So, ladies and gentlemen, as we enter the public comment session, please limit your comments to three minutes. Once your three minutes expires, we will mute your line so that we can move on to the next commenter in queue. We will definitely give you notice of that, but after three minutes, you will be muted. Okay, and as a reminder, to ask a question via the WebEx audio, please press the raise hand icon, which is located above the chat box on WebEx. If you are on the main line um, audio, please press pound two on your telephone keypad to enter the question or comment queue. All right, thanks, Michelle. Do we have any callers waiting to, uh, to be heard? I do not see anybody quite yet. Okay. Um, while we're waiting for that, I'm gonna just ask Martha, uh, any other comments that popped up or questions that popped up during our uh, event today? Or have we addressed everything? I think we've addressed all of the questions that came up. 
Great. All right, I do not currently see any um, questions or comments in the um, audio queue. Okay. All right, we're just gonna give Bobby, maybe give folks one more second to think. Um, but maybe we can start a wrap up. I would love to be able to give back to folks about 25 minutes of their afternoon back today. I think we could all use that. Uh, the um, hope that Bobby and I have is that we're gonna have our next CFO council meeting sometime in the spring. We haven't worked out a date yet, but please stay tuned. We're very hopeful that we can do these at least twice a year, if not more frequently. Um, so stay tuned for further announcements on that front as to an exact date and time, as well as registration information. I predict it's going to be virtual again, but you know, who knows? Everything is still up in the air. Please bear with us. Um, I do know we've gotten feedback generally from some of our, our other events that folks prefer the virtual uh, platform because it makes it more accessible to a lot more people um, as opposed to having to come in person. So um, that, uh, uh, Michelle, that's something. Michelle, I'm gonna I'm gonna pop in here, Alina. We do have one person who's trying to call in, Mr. Hammond, and is having yes, I do see that, Mr. Hammond. You are joined via WebEx audio, so you would need to um, click the raise hand icon. But I'm gonna go ahead and unmute your line for you, so that you can make your public comments. Uh, all right, okay. Mr. Hammond, your line is unmuted, sir. You may go ahead. Yes, uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. We can hear you. Okay. Uh, well, in three minutes, I can't uh, say very much, but let me just, uh, <clears throat> first, I'd like to uh, say that this council is co-chaired by two incredibly talented people with equally impressive leadership, Alina Simo. Georgetown University Law Center, Phi Beta Kappa from the University of Maryland, College Park, graduated with high honors, Bobby Talabian, University of Tennessee, College of Law, where he served on the Law Review, Go Vols. The Honorable David S. Fierio worked his way up from a Navy corpsman, saving lives. God bless you, thank you for your service, to a presidential appointment by Barack Obama as the 10th Archivist of the United States of America. Associate uh, General Anita Gupta graduated magna cum laude from Yale University and received her law degree from uh, New York University School of Law. Um, I, I don't have time to go through, uh, I'd ask for time to make some uh, oral presentations today. I'm gonna submit my speaker notes. I've already entered them as best I could into YouTube. And I would last ask that those be appended to the meeting minutes as my uh, oral comments, since there's not time to make them. Um, I have to say uh, that this is an unlawful meeting. It wasn't properly advertised in the Federal Register. That's not the first time this has happened. I attribute this and many other shortcomings to grossly inadequate funding for both OGIS and for uh, DOJ OIP. Uh, and I'm asking that DOJ and NARA please properly fund uh, these missions so that this beleaguered staff can properly do their job. With just a few minutes, I'd just like to skip to my closing remarks. And uh, those are great meeting today, but unlawfully held. Great people at OGIS and DOJ OIP, but grossly under-resourced and not enough of them. NARA and DOJ should take immediate action to properly resource OGIS and OIP respectively based on significant mission failure in not doing so. The situation is dire. We need an American OGIS and OIP rescue plan and an OGIS and OIP Build Back Better plan from Congress and the executive branch. The Chief Four Officer Council must post all of my public comments or state publicly the statutory basis for not doing so. Uh, the Chief Four Officers Council uh, should reconvene within two months to address public requester FOIA compliance concerns, hear my briefings, and decide on my recommendations. 
I do not believe that it was the intent of Congress or President Obama that oral public comments should be arbitrarily limited to 15 minutes per year in an open meeting. Thank you for considering my uh, oral comments and my written public comments. Uh, they're posted on the website. Please review them. There are several items in there that I'm seeking decisions from this uh, council on. I'd like to close with the words of proud American citizens. Uh, Gouverneur Thank Morris, so much Abraham comments, Lincoln, sir. and Martin Luther King, we the people enshrined in the Constitution will not again be a house divided against ourselves, no matter the rhetoric. In 1865, 165 years ago, we fought and won a bloody war to advance equity of opportunity, not guaranteed equity of outcomes, as we are all unique in our pursuit of our dreams. Messy as it is, that is our history. Mr. The greatest Hammond, nation in the history so of the world. Comments, Let us all the be judged by the content of our character. God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to make a comment, please press the raise hand icon on your WebEx screen if you're logged in on the WebEx audio. Otherwise, you may press pound two if you are on regular phone audio. Michelle, do we have any other callers? I do not see any other raised hands at this time. Okay. I don't see any other chat comments, but Martha, I'm just going to triple check with you to make sure we addressed all the questions that came in. We do okay. have actually, oops, well, ahead, someone was ahead. trying to make a comment and then they, oh, it looks like someone is um, in the queue. Are you able to take the comment? All right, Spencer, your line is unmuted. You may go ahead. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I actually had a question uh, uh, as it relates to FOIA improvements. Um, <clears throat> I was uh, recently, um, I guess, doing the uh, annual report, and uh, some some questions arose regarding being able to uh, pull these annual reports. And I, I know that you had mentioned um, that, that uh, one of the improvements looks like uh, we'll be able to get the, the quarterly analysis, you know, uh, individually, and, th and that helps a lot. When we've been running our reports, we've been, you know, running into conflicting issues using, you know, the old way of, uh, uh, you know, uh, counting the cases with uh, what we have on our share drive and then um, with FOIA Express. Uh, are there any ways to uh, help to ensure the accuracy of discrepancies between uh, what agencies are able to come up with as they're trying to learn and utilize FOIA Express? So uh, I, I know they mentioned some training, so just uh, asking that. Yeah, thank you for the question. And so just, I think a couple of things there. So um, we do go through a level of validation once the report comes to us um, to help zero in on potential data validation issues. Um, but before that, obviously the best uh, method to catch any kind of data errors or, or um, corrections is obviously at the at the raw level um, while you're producing your report. Um, so I will offer, uh, and we have a dedicated compliance team at OIP that works individually with agencies to troubleshoot these issues. Um, so I encourage you, if you don't mind, just reaching out to us, 202-514-FOIA, asking for a member of the compliance team, and we can work in the in, in the weeds on this with you to figure out what the, the best solution is. Um, another plug, though, is obviously um, the technology committee has a working group. Um, for FOIA Express, and this might be something of interest um, with other um, members of the group as far as the reporting functionality of FOIA Express. Uh, and so I encourage you to maybe reach out and, uh, as I said, they are always looking for volunteers um, and, uh, on that on that committee. But please reach out to us as you're preparing a report. Um, again, 202 514 FOIA, and we'll be happy to uh, troubleshoot what the issues are that you're having. Thank you. And uh, the second part of my question, 
um, goes out to the broad community. Um, I've noticed that there, um, that that uh, FOIA and just privacy as a whole uh, programs could benefit from a, um, a, a second tier analysis of, of their program capabilities and you know uh, uh, FOIA and privacy posture, um, so as there's no conflicts. So my question is, have you guys considered? Uh, recommending uh, third party uh, auditing or, uh, you know, interagency auditing of uh, FOIA programs to, you know, either be mandatory or highly encouraged. So I, I will, uh, one thing I wanted to offer is um, we have established, we have developed a FOIA, and I mentioned that we're going to update a FOIA self assessment toolkit. Um, which provides an objective way for you to evaluate each part of your FOIA program. Um, so I definitely would encourage you to use that toolkit to assess the needs of your agency and then it highlights relevant guidance and resources. And also um, our office is happy to work with you individually as you're assessing and um, looking for improvements. Thank you, Mr. Um, Speck. Christian for your comments. If anybody else has a comment, please um, place, a, um, place yourself in the queue with the raise hand icon or pound two on your phone. Just wanted to say, um, someone asked where we could find a transcript of this meeting, and I did respond in the chat, but we will be posting a transcript to our web website as soon as possible. Also, please be aware this has been live streamed on YouTube and will live on the National Archives YouTube channel for folks to watch at a later time. Thank you. All right, and there are no additional questions in queue. All right, um, so I think Bobby, we can get ready to wrap up. Um, I think it's been a great meeting today. Again, just very grateful for all the presentations we've had. I hope it gets everyone excited about the possibility of joining your um, federal colleagues on, um, on these committees and working groups and subcommittees. So, please consider signing up. And um, as I said earlier, we will reconvene in the spring. Please look out for uh, further notifications on that. Um, I wanna wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. Hope everyone stays healthy, healthy safe, and resilient during these continuing difficult times. Um, and Bobby, over to you. Thank you, Alina. And uh, thank you again, to everyone who's joining us for a really great meeting um, and a special thanks to our uh, presenters, particularly the, the two co-chairs of the committees um, for the great presentation, but more importantly, the great work that they're doing that's gonna benefit, that benefits all of us. Um, just one more plug, please, if you are interested, reach out to us um, for working with the committees. Uh, we are uh, interested in your participation uh, and also very open to what our next meeting in the spring would look like. If there's anything uh, that you would like us to address or uh, happy to include, uh, agencies as part of the program, agency CFOs or agency FOIA off officials. Um, if you do have suggestions, please reach out to either myself or Alina. And uh, with that, I um, just want to thank everyone again and wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.